Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation, you believed in him and were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we all acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And the church said, Amen. you know, when you hear the word promise, it's hard not to be cynical. We, uh, we've all known people who have made us promises and, and then didn't keep them. Advertisers make promises and then break them and Politicians make promises and break them over and over. CEOs of corporations make promises and break them. Teachers make promises. Preachers make promises. Husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, moms, dads, uncles, aunts, friends break promises, but not grandparents. And so we have a phrase in our culture Promises, promises, promises. Today we are here to celebrate that there is one who keeps every promise. Amen. He is the promise keeper. In 2 Peter 3, 9 it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. In Romans 4, 20 and 21 no unbelief made him, and he's referring to Abraham. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, amen. Amen. Your father, your spiritual father, your heavenly father keeps his word. Your father, he cannot lie and has never lied and will never lie. So when God says something, does he mean it? If he says it, will he do it? Every time. Now about that, about that, to recognize God as Lord is to recognize and acknowledge that it is he that is sovereign, it is he that is supreme in the universe. It is to fully understand that what God wants is vastly more important than what we want. What God wants is more important than what anyone else wants, including you. So it begs the question, who's the Lord? The God of heaven and earth, the Almighty, who sits enthroned around the angels and the 24 elders being worshipped by countless angels, who's in control of all things because he is a sovereign God, or... Are you sitting on your throne controlling your own destiny and your own life? Who's Lord? Because it's either God or you. Or you can make others that too. 
You can surrender your freedom and your volition and your free will and your moral agency to someone else, and they become your Lord. It's called codependency. Knowing that God is Lord and knowing what he decrees and knowing that what he dictates is obligatory means we don't have the option of not doing what he says. We don't have that option. We don't have the option to disobey his commands and still receive the blessings and promises of God. You see, it's a covenant. It's a two-way thing. You do this, I do this. That's a covenant. We call it a contract. But the idea is this. God says, you do what I say, and I will bless you, and then I will bring you into my eternal home where you will be with me forever in a perfect place with perfect people, and even you yourself will be perfect. And that's all conditioned on what? Doing what he says. There is no such thing as a disobedient disciple. That's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist in the kingdom of God. You cannot regularly, habitually, over and over and over, break the will of God and sin and call God your Lord because you're not making God Lord when your sin is your Lord. Whatever he says, he wants done. Amen. Whatever he says. Because, you see, God is a God who keeps his word, and he wants us to do the same. And if we say, save me, you're my Lord, then he wants us to live that way, that he is the Lord. Why do you call me Lord and not do what I say, Jesus asked, with heartache, I think, in his voice. Many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do a bunch of great stuff? And he goes, I don't even know who you are. Scary, huh, Matthew 7? <laughs> yes. Scary, isn't it? Didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we do miracles? Didn't we do ministry in your name? And he goes, who are you again? Because you're not doing the will of my Father. How much of that will? Thank you. Thank you. So God keeps his word. He expects us to do the same, does he not? And because God is who he is, and because he loves us so very much, he's made us, his children, his faithful, his disciples, his followers, his servants, He's made Christians. He's made believers unique promises that no one else gets. No one else. God is in the gift-giving mood. I imagine since it's Christmas season, you know what that means. I imagine some of you have gone out and decided it was too cold to shop in real life, so you ordered from Amazon. And so you're trying to think about, what can I give them that they could actually use and not just stick in a drawer and not use again and give it a, a white elephant party someday? What, what, what can I give them that, that won't be a waste? What can I give them that will be a blessing? What can I give them that they wouldn't get for themselves? Those are the questions I ask when I'm shopping by Amazon in the warmth of my home. God is in the gift-giving mood all the time, year-round, every day. He's in that mood always because he loves his children. And he loves being generous to his children, even though they don't really deserve. It's not really about deserving, is it? No, it's about loving. Now, we, we just read together Ephesians chapter 1. I, I, I encourage you to turn your Bible to that. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, all the way through verse 14. Guess what? This is the longest sentence in the entire Bible. This is the, in the original language, this is a, the longest sentence. 
In your Bible, you've got periods and commas. Well, in the Greek, they just, they, you know, it was expensive to write on manuscripts, so they didn't use punctuation. But in this letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, in verse 3, when he says blessed, and he, at the end in verse 14, he says glory, he didn't put a period on that until glory. It's all one sentence. It, it's, it's, he gets so filled with the praise of who he's talking about and how amazing God is and how God has been so generous to us. He gets so caught up in that. He's like that little kid who went somewhere and it was fantastic. And when you go, did you have a good time? And 10 minutes later, that kid's still telling you about it because the kid can't find a period in the sentence because that means I have to stop talking about how great that thing was. Remember how you used to get, some, some of you, remember how you used to get like that? Oh man, it was so great, and then we went over there, and then you won't believe what we saw. Remember that, some of you? Do some of you even remember that? This is Paul. Paul is writing this powerful, wonderful, amazing letter, but he starts off absolutely just filled. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to think that he's incarcerated while he's doing this. Wow. We fuss at God because the light won't turn green fast enough. Oh, my word, do we have a long way to go. And this is the longest sentence in the Bible, and it's just packed. It's just packed. Well, we're just going to hit some highlights. Aren't you glad? Say yes. Thank you. Verse 3. This is, the, this is it. This is the launch point. This is the runway where the plane takes off. This is, the, this is the beginning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with most every spiritual blessing. Isn't that what it says? Yes or no? Oh, some of, somebody's paying attention. Somebody's had coffee. Let's read that again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with almost every spiritual blessing. Makes a difference, doesn't it, adding one little word, doesn't it? No wonder God said, don't add to my word and don't take away. My point is this. When it says every, how much does that include? All of it. And you know what it says? Not that he will bless you with he has already, past tense, it's yours already, every spiritual blessing. Man, I wish we lived that, don't you? We keep asking God for something, he says, uh, uh, this year's already, what are you asking me for it again? I've already given it to you. Ah. And so when it says every, it leaves nothing out, every spiritual blessing blessing. If you're in Christ, and this entire passage is filled with that phrase, in him, in the beloved, in Christ. And in this passage, if you're in Christ, if you have done what the scriptures say to get into Christ and you are in Christ, then God makes all these promises to you. This is a fantastic verse. I'm going to just read it to you, and maybe you know where it is. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. I, I venture to say there are some of you who have been in the church a long time and may have never seen 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. If you're in Christ, whatever promise God made to those in Christ is yes. I like getting a yes from God, don't you? Am I the only one in the house who likes a yes? I love yeses. Me too. And since God is in a gift-giving mood, what do you want? 
Do you want peace? That's in there. Ephesians 1. You want grace? That's in there. You want joy? It's in there. You want wisdom? It's in there. You want victory? It's in there. You want strength? It's in there. You want forgiveness? Yes, I do. It's in there. You want to be redeemed? Yes, it's in there. You want eternal life? Do you want to have a purpose for your life until you see him face to face? Hmm. Do you want God to take up permanent residence inside your soul through the form of the Holy Spirit and be your coach to help you through life until you see him face to face? As long as you remain faithful and are in Christ, that's your promise. It's in there. So I've asked you, what do you want? But now I'm asking you, what do you need? Which is a different question, isn't it? Are you in pain? And I'm not talking about joints and bones and stuff. I'm talking about pain. Are you in pain? This time of year is filled with pain. Are you confused? Don't know which way to go and don't know which door to open. Don't know the answers. Are you being manipulated? Is this the truth? Is this fake? Do you need reliable answers? Do you, do you need patience? Oh, nobody in the room needs that, do they? We don't need any patience. We're not doctors. <laughs> do you need courage not to give up? Do you need a bigger heart? Because God says, I have already promised and already am giving you every spiritual blessing. And they're already yours in Christ. So from God's part, he's done what he promised. But now let's talk about our side. It's time to look at the human part of this, the the, the role that we have in this. In, in, in Ephesians 1 and verse 12, it says, uh, so that we were the first to hope in Christ. You see, the, the people he's writing to stopped looking for hope in the world and they stopped looking at, at it within themselves and they stopped listening to the experts. And boy, I'm telling you, the Greeks had a lot of experts. Oh, my word. Everybody wanted to be an expert. The top dogs in the whole culture were experts. Everybody, everybody admired the experts. Well, that doesn't sound relevant today at all, does it? And so they stopped listening to the experts, and they stopped listening to people's opinions. They stopped listening to the gossip in the marketplace. They stopped listening to what all these people were thinking, and they looked for Christ, and they found Christ, and they, and they became in Christ, and, and the result of that was they had hope. They had hope. And they trusted Christ's sacrifice for that hope. And then in verse 13, is, he says, you heard the word of truth. <clears throat> so in order to trust Christ, we, we have to be real. We have to be true. We, our part now. We're not talking about God's part. We're talking about our part, our, our role in this contract, this, this covenant. In order for God to change and improve your life, listen to me now, if you don't hear anything else, open up this precious book and let him tell you for himself what is true. Open the book. Read it. 
Find out what it's saying. I got a wonderful call from a sister this week who, who was just super excited because she's picked up her Bible and is reading it on her own because she wants to. Amen. <laughs> And she's like going, oh, I'm just so excited. I can't believe what I'm reading. It's just such great news. Everything's changing, she says. And, and when you read in this, you're going to read what's called the gospel of your salvation. Mentioned here in verse 13. It, Jesus took on flesh. The word became human. He died in our stead to pay our penalty so that we would not be punished by God, that we might live eternally with the Lord. And, and then he rose again after being crucified. The, the gospel of salvation is, is that that Jesus paid the penalty with his blood. And he invites us to be his, purchased by that blood, washed by that blood. And, and when you read the word of God, then you have reasons to believe in him, which is also mentioned in verse 13. You see, God did his part, and Jesus did his part, and having faith in Christ is your part. And, and that's why in John 1, 12 it says, but to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. We are made children by faith. It's not obedience. It's not compliance. We're made children by faith. And, and, and that faith comes by hearing, and the hearing comes by, thank you. It comes by the word of God. And our father loves giving gifts to his kids. And, and we're not talking about money. And we're not talking about status or beauty or possessions or health. We're not talking about that. We're talking about gifts that God gives. Holy Spirit gifts. And if we believe, then we get those gifts. You see, many of us are going, well, how come I don't feel joy? And how come I don't feel uh, like I have a purpose? Or, or why am I so confused? Or Because your faith, it needs a power up. Your, your faith can't just be academic. Until your faith travels through your neck into your heart and becomes trust, you will not realize these promises. Because God promises those who trust in the Lord. Amen? And that's the difference. And also, he, he only makes these promises to those who obey his commands, those who, who follow his word. If you've repented of your sins, if you've confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, risen from the dead, and that he is your Lord, if you've been, if you've been uh, baptized and had all your sins washed away, and if you're remaining faithful, then you know what it means to have God give you blessings you would never see otherwise. And so God is a is a, is a gift-giving God. And guess what? These riches that come from God, they're eternal riches. In Christ, uh, in Christ, we get what money can never buy. And in Christ, we enjoy these gifts because God is a giver. By the way, these gifts are only the beginning. It gets better later. That's called hope, isn't it? You say, I can't figure it out. God says, I will direct your steps. 
You say, I'm too tired, and God says, I will give you rest. You say, it's impossible, and God says, all things are possible. You say, nobody loves me, and God says, I love you. You say, I can't forgive myself, God says, I forgive you. You say, well, I'm not smart enough. God says, I'll give you wisdom. You say, I can't go on. And you know what God says? My grace is sufficient for you, child. I can't do it. I can't. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's what he says. I can't manage. I'll supply all your needs, he says. You say, I'm afraid, and he says, I have not given you a spirit of timidity and fear. You say, I feel all alone. Then he says, I will never leave nor forsake you. Those are promises to us. If you want to know God, Take a look at some of the promises in the Bible. You may not want to look at all of them. There's 8,000 of them. I mean, if you count every single promise he made to every single person in the Bible, some guy wrote a book, and he was a really smart guy named Herbert Lockyer, and he found 8,000 promises. Well, there's a shorter list if you want. And it's amazing. If you want to know God, know him through his promises. Amen? Let's uh, sing right now. If you've got something heavy on your heart today, let us help you with that.